Okay, first off, I know it's a bit dark. It'll get some light in a minute when the movie starts playing, but this is a paid request for Jonathan Lindsay. Thank you so much for that. For those interested in requesting pretty much any type of videos, whether it be a commentary, review, a topic, reaction, a ranking, a list, whatever it may be, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. And of course, this is the... A 1990 movie called Total Recall, a commentary for that. So again, thank you, John and Lindsay, once again. I don't know if this will be the same as other people who have it, because I watched this on the Blu-ray. It does have a Studio Canal studio thing at the beginning. I know that Studio Canal is not the same on everyone's copy, because some people may have just the DVD. So... Maybe I'll skip that one just in case people don't have it. So let me go through the Studio Canal logo. Just in case people don't have it. And then this is the TriStar. Would it be, would TriStar be at the beginning of each one? And then you have Carol Cole. Damn, forgot how many. I think people will probably have the TriStar one. So I'm going to pause it at the beginning of that one. So, like, the one with the Steel T now is like 21 seconds in. <laughs> so, let me count down. 3, 2, 1, pressing play. Whoa, boy, whoa, why horse? Fucking wings, what's going on? Ah, uh, fucking white horse. <laughs> there was a movie with Richard Pryor that had that same thing. The only good thing about the movie, Another You. On Terracle. Terracle, the company that released uh, first couple Rambo films, Terminator 2, Universal Soldier. Big movies, big stars. But Sally, they spent too much money. Uh, I think they were getting ready to work on stuff like that ISO bar where Sylvester Stallone and Roland Emmerich, but then just again, too much money being spent giving people jets and whatever. Paul Verhoeven, he had done Robocop. Arnold was a fan of it, so he looked at that. Arnold, career was going up. I mean, yeah, he had done films like Red Heat, which didn't do the best, but he, you know, Predator, Commando. But this was even bigger into the, the highlight of a f box office. And then after this, you had Terminator 2. And the one-two punch of Total Recall and Terminator 2. It was like... And then, of course, Kindergarten Cop and Twins before they were hits. Uh, well, Twins was before. The Kindergarten Cop was around the same time. So think about that. Two comedy hits, Twins before this, around this time, Kindergarten Cop. They have an action hit like Total Recall and Terminator 2. It's like, wow, this guy has hits in comedies. He has hits in action films. And then there's sci-fi... This is like the biggest star around. And Jerry Goldsmith, may you rest in peace, fantastic composer, my favorite composer, composed the first three Ramble films, the first Alien, Star Trek The Motion Picture, Runaway, which is an underrated Tom Selleck film, love Jerry Goldsmith. Rob Boutine worked on effects for John Carver's The Thing, Robo Team disappeared. No one can find him, it seems. No one knows what the hell happened to Robo Team. One day, he just disappeared. Mario Trasar, Andrew Vagina. Then they helped produce Terminator 2 and first couple Rambo films, Universal Soldier. Ronald Shusett and Dan O'Bannon, two guys that helped write the original script for Alien. Total Recall was in the works for a long time. At one point, Dino De Laurentiis was producing it. And then at one time, they don't have it, uh, David Cronenberg was going to direct it. There's another time where <clears throat> I think uh, Patrick Swayze was going to star in it. That never worked out. But Dino De Laurentiis was ready to produce a film. His company went up Shit Creek. And Arnold was with Mario Cressard and Andrew Vaja and said, You need to get that. Because he wanted to do it for a while, but Dino De Laurentiis said, No, you cannot do this. 
your accent, all that. But Arnold really wanted to do the picture. So again, when the company, Dino De Laurentiis' company was going up the creek, Arnold told these guys, buy this project. This is a lot of potential. And they did. And that's the thing with Terrico, is that they just spent too much money on stuff. I mean, they had big hits. This, Terminator 2, you're a soldier. You know. Ram First Blood, Ramble First Blood Part 2. Ramble 3 made some money overseas, and sadly Ramble 3 is now relevant with what's going on in the world today. There's that the bug eyes with Rob Bottin's effects. Which works in a nightmare scene, because that's a nightmare image. Maybe something looks goofy now, but uh, when that happens later on, it's like, okay, you're dead. There's no way your eyes can pop up, you know, two, you know, five inches away, and then go back in, and your eyes are perfectly fine, not even a blood trickling down. But, uh, you know, I think that's what works with a movie, is that when a movie gives you enough good merit, enough good worth, enough solid entertainment... Even something as ridiculous as that, you can go with it because the movie has earned its way. That's the thing with a movie. It can earn its a lot of good points where even something as crazy as that, you you can skirt the issues you could have with it. Here we have Arnold with Sharon Stone. Sharon Stone would work with Paul Verhoeven after this one, Basic Instinct. And this is way better than the remake of Total Recall with Colin Farrell. The, the remake of Total Recall is sterile, is bland, is forgettable. It has no, like, passion to it, to me. It has no, <clears throat> like this, you got the violence and the, even this with the skin on skin. And you had that Paul, Paul Verhoeven quality. Paul going, I don't give a fuck, which was great. As we're talking about this conflict going on Mars, when just replace that with the Ukraine. If anyone from the Ukraine, I don't think I have anyone who watched my stuff from the Ukraine, and if they did, they'd be busy with other stuff, not a redneck on YouTube like me. Uh, wish you the best of luck, man, going on over there. Sally, there's not much I can say because it'd be pointless, but. Wishing them the best, man. Again, sad that Ramble 3, the Russian stuff, was you got crapped on at the time for not being relevant. Well, now it's very relevant. But this is a film that, uh, like Sharon Stone, let me get into her, I'm not a fan of her as a person. To Sharon Stone is a, she seemed like a person that just, whatever could get her ahead in the business, she'll do. And she'll use anyone. Because you hear a lot of stories of, like, her being a complete asshole on Teen Solomon's Minds, those film, the film with Richard Chamberlain. Or some weird stuff that I remember Wes Craven described. Like... Sharon Stone sent him like a bunch of like dead roses or something. I don't know. Just she just seems like someone who is. If she did get ahead, she would stab you in the back type of individual. And I mean, she was in hits. This was a hit, and before that, she was in Above the Law with Steven Seagal. But. You don't really hear about Sharon Stone a lot nowadays. Number one, because she did films like Basic Instinct 2, which was a flop, or Catwoman. And I think number two is that she, probably under the radar, got a bit of a reputation as being difficult to work with, or a pain in the ass, and it's like, okay, fine. We got other individuals we'll use. Just again, what has Sharon Stone really done in the longest while? Was she in that Dennis Quaid film? Cold Creed Manor? Is that someone else? I can barely remember that movie. <laughs> but she does a good job here being the, the sexy, 
playful wife, and you know, you get this whole situation with Arnold's character. Is he just a regular worker, and this is his loving wife, and the whole thing is just a a dream? You know, what he goes to recall, it is this fucked up accident, or was he really this super agent that got his mind screwed with and kind of pl placed almost to be with well, the Tower Cubs, the ultimate bull. Now, to be honest, when most of us watch this, we kind of look down that fashion, because the the other one is, oh yeah, by the end, he got a lobotomy and he's dead. It's like, oh, that's depressing. So we just looked at, this is Arnold also, which is like, yeah, I could buy him as a super agent. I love this X-ray thing. I always thought that was a cool visual. I still like it. Some people... They just go, oh, it's dated. I think it looks cool. Plus, every fucking film is dated. A year after the film comes out is dated. Just like, oh, they would never... Come on, like, they have these old school TVs on the subway? Because it's 1990. Maybe they were... I don't know if they were making it maybe in 89. Because it came out in 1990. Or maybe, I know a lot of this film was shot in Mexico. Which, apparently, a lot of people got sick during it. Because of the water, some of the food. It's interesting, the recall spell with a K. So I'm kind of surprised they didn't spell the title with a K, recall. I guess they still thought, well, guys, you guys can't spell. This guy, Harry... I recognize this guy. I can't remember his name. I think another film I saw him in, I believe, was City Slickers. I believe he was the guy when, before Billy Crystal gives his speech to the kids in the classroom, including his son, played by Jay Gyllenhaal. This other guy gives a speech and about how he lifted this thing to save this woman. I believe that's him. Definitely seems like a guy that would have been in a lot of like mob movies. I didn't give this dirty look. Is this a dirty look because uh, he's not going to listen to me? They could fuck with your head, or oh no, this guy's going to do this and it could screw up our plans. But yeah, like the remake of Total Recall, which like I say, it was just kind of it was. Just, very bland. It had no personality. Like, even this here is kind of cool. This lady changing the the color in her nails and just the way it looks. Like, the vibrancy of the color of the film and in the remake, in the remake, everything looks so like this, the same type of, like, muted color and Heavily digital and I don't know, just got boring to look at after a while. I don't know, it's just such a forgettable in when you're out the other movie. And that has some good actors, Brian Cranston, John Cho, but I don't know, just lame. It didn't need to be remade in the first place. And then it's like, well, it could take stuff from the novel, because it was based on a story, Philip K. Dick. I mean, well, that's not even the case, because the original story, I don't think they ever went to Mars in the... Well, they didn't go to Mars there, but I don't... I still don't think it was similar to the... The story. The short story, I mean. So they even follow that. They said, well, based on the original story, not really. It, just, it still felt like just kind of a beat-for-beat beat remake of this movie. Only with a lot of fucking lens flares. That's another thing. This doesn't have lens flares. You can't play a drinking game with... A, how many lens flares can you have? Speaking of which, let me get my mellow yellow. Come on, don't bullshit me. There you go. 
Arnold nowadays, I mean, his political stuff, and uh, some guy was arguing me a long time ago, well, how do you know Arnold was a shitty governor? I'm like, well, ask a lot of people from California, they would call him a shitty governator. But I liked Arnold as an actor. It's just a lot of his stuff he says nowadays, it's like, Arnold, just be quiet, man. Just be quiet, screw your freedom. Well, yeah, as this movie would say, screw you! But Arnold, growing up, was one of those guys I watch a lot, like Stallone, like Van Damme. Stallone and Van Damme I liked more, but I, I always liked Arnold. My favorite is Predator. Uh, the Running Man is very close. End of Days, I think, is very underrated. That would be in my top five, just because... End of Days, I mean, it's Arnold kicking the devil's ass. Come on now. But this would easily be in my top ten. Like I said, Predator, The Running Man, End of Days, this one would be in my top ten. Commando would be in my top ten. Commando's up there. I think that would have to be number three. Yeah, I think it would have to be Predator, The Running Man, Commando. The Running Man I put a little bit ahead because it's more underrated for me. Then End of Days, number four, because again, it's a little bit underrated. Yeah, Predator the Running Man, Commando, End of Days. This might be top, this might be five. This might be five, because the story's interesting. Arnold, to play this normal guy, and then this confused guy, and all the cool effects, details, whether the, the tracking in the nose, the draw automated driver, the, the mutants on Mars, <clears throat> the hyper-violence by Paul Verhoeven. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, in retrospect, this would have to be a top five. Jerry Goldsmith's score. I even like the, the way this looks here with the chair, which they try to replicate in the, the new one. Again, it's like, you want to do a remake, it could be a completely different thing but you, you, yeah, you try to do this. There's even a deleted scene where they try to do the thing with the three tittied lady, and the I don't know if it's like the lead scene in the remake or maybe it was in the remake. I don't remember. Maybe. See, this is the thing. These images he's seeing on here are images he will see later. I did get into that. Is this him having this freak out delusion? Because the images we see on that screen are the images we're going to see later as an audience. Or is it all for real? <clears throat> but I don't know if there's anyone who enjoys the film that does look as the lobotomy type of movie. Uh, maybe there are. But I do think there's more that look at kind of the more straight-laced type. Oh, and he selects the, the look of the woman. So it's this woman in his dreams, Rachel Tickerton. Rachel Tickerton. See, like, you probably couldn't even do this nowadays, just be labeled sexist. Oh my god, he, he's looking at what kind of woman he wants, and it's like this duty mannequin, and. What, he he drew like voluptuous or he drew like Demir? Um. <laughs> See, and on the TV, real quick, it looks just like Rachel Tititan. It's like, well, wait a minute. Is this a delusion because it looks like her? Or does it look like her because this is what Arnold's imagining because of his dream? Rachel Tickerton, she would be in other stuff too. She was in Con Air. She was one of the guards in Con Air. And uh, we'll get to Rachel Tickerton later. She doesn't pop up for a while, but uh, Rachel Tickerton, I, I do enjoy. I always, th I th well, I didn't always think, but if you wanted to do a comic book version of April O'Neil for the Ninja Turtles, when you look at April in the original Mirage comics. It looks like Rachel Tickerton. 
It, it does. Like the original black and white barrage comics. You looked at the April O'Neil in that. I'm like, Rachel Tititin could play April. And if you cast her as April O'Neil, I think she, I, I'd have no problem. Just, I think she's a good actress. Underrated actress. She doesn't get used a lot. You put my cover! My name is not Quaid. And Arnold does a good job. This is one of his better acting roles. My name is not Quaid. And Arnold was buff as shit during this time. Whether any of that was enhanced by certain attributes, that's up to you. Because a lot of people in the 80s, whether it be wrestlers, whether it be actors... You could be a bit chemically enhanced. <laughs> and again, that's up to you to decide whether that's the case or not. But I think it's... Yeah, you could try to tell, but... There's still a lot of work put into it. Bodybuilding, weightlifting, for some doing martial arts, and a lot more training. <clears throat> That's why, to me, I go into more of the, this is all for real. Because how could Arnold visualize this scene? He's unconscious. He's asleep. Like, Arnold's is unconscious and asleep. Why would he reveal, visualize this? And this goes into, yeah, he had something planted in before. I didn't, Arnold's not even thinking. His, his mind isn't even thinking. His unconscious isn't thinking. Or just people could assume, yeah... In a way it is, because he's visualizing himself being knocked out. But then wouldn't he visualize the in-between here? But again... I, yeah, I always thought this was an interesting idea to have this AI... Because that's what people want in one day, the self-driving car... Apparently in the new Chainsaw Master, there's a fucking self-driving car. And the fact that they put this human-looking robot because they feel, well, people may be too nervous to, if you have nobody there. So even the kind of psychological aspect of having something that looks human driving you maybe ease you into a more of a comfortable stance. It's still a robot doing it, but... Oh, they see they see something that kind of looks human. Maybe I did do like a comfortable stance. Were you my father? <laughs> what the fuck did I do wrong? I saw this film a lot on VHS, along with the Arnold films like Predator. Predator, I wore out the tape. Like, I had the old CBS Fox, uh, CBS video of, yeah, CBS Fox video of Predator, and I, I would kind of, I wish I still had that VHS, because, like, the cover was completely worn out. You saw more white on the cover than the actual artwork. <laughs> you know, Arnold did the phone booth and put the, put the superhero costume and boom. Yeah, just explode with blood there. Bone crack it. Get the fuck off me. A net breaker. Yeah. Fuck you and your gun. Now that's a blood squib. That's a blood squib. This Robocop. Paul Verhoeven's like, you want a blood squib? The low explosive to make it seem like someone got shot. That's a squib. Boom. Apparent, prominent. You can see it. And then he's like, what the hell did I do? See, this one's more visceral. The remake... The one time I tried to be interesting with the direction is... When Colin Farrell did this thing with all the shooting... And is going to all these different people... Like the camera... And like it never did that again. But here it keeps the visceralness. It... It keeps the visceralness throughout, whether it be 
can off Biker Ironside's arm. See you at the party, Rita. Whether it be the when he's on the the escalator and use that that dead body uses as a shield. And God turns the hammer to beat. But yeah, I mean, you look at the remake. It's like, okay, you have the wife. And then the wife attacks him. I just... So much shit that just seemed like the same fucking movie. Only It's like, why am I going to watch this? I'll just watch this movie. And 1990 was a pretty good year for movies. I mean, you know, speaking of Ninja Turtles, I mentioned before, the 1990 Ninja Turtles came out. You have Die Hard 2. You have... Oh, there's Michael Ironside, our villain for the film. Great guy, Michael Ironside. Like, great actor, intense... Not many times he got to play a good guy. Usually he was portrayed as the bad guy. And I, I'm kind of... I didn't grow up with the Total Recall Nintendo game, but I did play that years later. And this is one of those annoying sections in the game where you're in the apartment and the wife is shooting you. And you have to keep punching the wife... But you gotta do it fast enough where the door will open, you could go through the door. Otherwise, Michael Ironside's character will get by the door and just keep shooting. And then you can't escape the room and you'll get killed. It's like the damn timer thing on the Nintendo game. The Nintendo game is awful for this. Awful fucking game. Maybe one day I'll play that for the channel. Since I know how to kind of do it on my laptop now. I'll cheat using save states. <laughs> and some nasty slices on there. Actually, I forgot what I was even talking about before. It just wasn't that important. But yeah, Michael Ironside is a damn good actor. I think he was one of the people up for Robocop. I could be wrong, though. Before they got Peter Weller. But Michael Ironside would work with Paul Verhoeven and you know, Starship Troopers. Michael Ironside would be in speed of Arnold, like the one Terminator from Arnold's Not End, Terminator Salvation. Michael Ironside's in that. And he was a nobody. That was the last thing I saw him in, was nobody. It was a small role, but it was, oh, cool, this is Michael Ironside. He's the guy that. Uh, our le the lead character, nobody, Odenkirk, he bought the place from and gave him this, like, gold and stuff. As like, okay, you do have this. So that he could set the whole place up with traps and guns and stuff. <clears throat> Again, these two work well in this scene, this sort of playful banter, and then... Clever girl. But she tries this again later, it doesn't quite work the next time. Of course, again, nowadays you can't do this because it would be labeled sexist. It's like, it's not sexist, it's someone who tried to kill him. <laughs> Nothing sexist about that. I'm sorry that if someone has a gun on you or tries to kill you, like, I could not do it because I will get canceled and it is a woman. Like, yeah, okay, then you're dead. I will be alive. And uh, when you're dead and <laughs> you could talk about how noble you are and your crusade of equality when you're, uh, you're dead. 
Yeah, Mother Ironside is always intense and greatly so. That's why I wish he was able to. Very few. I think he was in a film with Brad Dourif where he was, you know, not a villain. It was more of a drama. There are a couple lower budget films. I know I've seen them where he's not a villain, but it wasn't often. There's not like a lot of big movies that you have to be like the main hero. And I think he could have done it like a James Woods. Like if Michael Irons like starred in like a John Carpenter's Vampires type of movie. You know that type of, even you know that type of like action horror film. I think he could work very well on that. His intensity is whatever villains it may be. Or a cop movie, like James Wood's film Cop, or like Detective against a serial killer. I think my guys had to really make that work. Here's the X ray scene. Did a great visual thing, probably just animated. And I think it looks cool like this. There's a certain unique aesthetic to it. It's such a neat sound effect too. It's not just break your glass, it's this that really makes the scene even a bit more effective. I like the lighting. That's the thing, like back to the day you didn't have all this fucking filter shit. Yes, every once in a while a film can have filters put in, but every fucking film has these filters put in. So it just makes it seem either all look the same or look just all false and altered and here you say no, we have to use the lighting that we have on the set. I do like the way this Blu-ray looks too. Like the I think I think it's a nice looking transfer. Oh, uh, here we have this guy. Like I look at this violence, man. You can't see this in a movie, let alone a big bunch of movie today. This is just using this fucking guy as a shield. He just becomes a fucking meat puppet. Or when they do use blood, it's like, oh, we gotta alter it with CGI. I'm like, no, just don't. You just ruin it. It just, you know, this fucking alternate of CGI, just stupid. If you, if you don't try it for practical, don't fucking add additional CG elements. It's fucking stupid. It's weird, like, people look at films like this today and say, wow, that works. So let's not do it again. Let's not utilize that again. Here's a challenge I want people to do in Hollywood. I want you to try to make these big budget action films, sci-fi films, like this. And not use CGI. Because that will make them more creative, work harder, and use their imagination more. And a variety of different tools. So not all films look the fucking same. Don't use filters, don't use CG. Whether it be map paintings, models, squibs, miniatures... Oh, that's the thing about films in even the 80s, early 90s. It was a variety of different things. It was prosthetics. It was animatronics. Again, it was map paintings. It was miniatures. It was various different props. It was practical you know, effects. Rubber. All this stuff that you could use in a different variety of ways. And they don't do it. It's just... CG, CG, CG. Yes, there are some films today that do use models, to be fair. But, again, it's like not much variety. Again, I challenge these guys to do a film. N not that it automatically will make a good film. Is, what makes this film work is a variety of things. But, if I try to do something like that, 
or we got some advertisement for Philips Audio and Coca-Cola and the Hotel Ritz. This guy with the glasses, I know I've seen him in another movie, but I cannot remember what it is. Hmm. Can't remember. See, like nowadays, this will all be like on a cell phone to contact someone, but... They makes it a little bit more unique. I don't know why, like this guy on the the little TV type screen, always look like I don't know Richard Deere's dad <laughs> or Michael Landon's brother. <laughs> For those who remember Michael Landon, Little House on the Prairie. It's like, it's like his brother or again, like Richard Deere's dad. <laughs> See, and this is why Roddy Cox wanted Michael Ironside to stop because he wants to use this guy as a mole. This, this is why when you find out Roddy Cox is part of his plan, okay, Michael Ironside's not going to listen to me. I need this guy to get to Mars and use this as a plan to get into the leader of the resistance so I'm going to use this guy and the suitcase is like there goes Richard Deere's dad <laughs> fuck you ass <laughs> See, like a little scene like that. Did you need that scene? No, but it brings a little, again, a little bit of personality to it. Fuck you, you asshole. And then Arnold does like a bow. <laughs> oh shit. This is where he has to drive the damn thing himself. This is the problems with this kind of vehicle. And of course with Arnold's body and strength, you're able to get away with something like this. <laughs> and then it's a lot of these little scenes that add up to a memorable movie. Like, okay, here's this little robot just drive drive shit okay I'm just gonna rip it off and do a different little type of a chase scene I'm trying to remember what did he say he, he says this guy dickhead or something Yeah, it says, sue me, dickhead. And, like, the thing, like, goes nuts and tr almost tries to kill Arnold or something. <laughs> like, was it just a malfunction? Or it's almost like it got pissed at Arnold and said, fuck you, man. And here's where we're going to get these little stuff that we're going to use later on. Like this image duplica duplicator. Money from Mars. Of course in red. Different IDs. Get him through where he needs to go. That's going to take out the tracker. Up your nose with a rubber hose. Oh, and that's the duplicator. What the fuck? I 
Which, this is a, a cool thing that gets used later. This is the kind of thing I would see in video games after this, too. Like, Dude Nukem has this kind of hologram thing. If you play Dude Nukem, you have this thing where there's like a hologram. So that bad guys try to go after that. I mean, nowadays it'd be like a, just a cell phone that you would just get a recording on instead of like this, the entire suitcase being this message. Fuck you and me. Did you ask the mouse? <laughs> no shit. Or something like 1990, it was, for me, when I looked at the type of films I liked, again, horror films, I like Stephen King's Graveyard Shift, I like The First Power, I like Exorcist 3, Child's Play 2, uh, you have films like, I did Die Hard 2, and Total Recall, and the, the, the first Ninja Turtles film, I like The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, the Rookie with Clint Eastwood and Charlie Sheen. Arachnophobia. Which actually that guy who was on the commercial for Recall, he was in Arachnophobia. Just this thing where, I mean, it's, ugh. like, you know, keep going until you hear the crunch. Yeah, this is where we get into some uh, Rob, Rob Bottin's effects. Rob Bottin, again, he worked. Ugh. That's pretty good, Arnold effects. Especially for the time. That, yeah, that's pretty good. That was pretty good. It's not like the 84 Terminator where you had the Arnold. And yeah, nowadays it looks a bit stiff. After you get the eyeball. Like that's still fairly good. And the fact that it's supposed to be in pain and moving. It's like, okay, it makes sense because you're trying to get this big fucking thing out of your nose. Now, I don't know if you could do that with the nose. I think... I don't know if the nose really stretches that far. I'm not going to fucking try, but I'm like, would the thing that big could, would the nose even be able to stretch that far? But you, you're not supposed to think of that. I don't know why Arnold would not just shoot the screen. Like, he probably had enough... Unless he ran out of bullets. Because I like, just shoot the screen so that they wouldn't hear anything. There's the tracker that's... Taking him in the wrong direction. Yeah, Paul Verhoeven, after this, I mean, this was a success. Well, what was a success? And he got Basic Instinct, and that was a success. Again, it shows how bad Michael Ironside is. Shoots the rat, got the blood hitting the thing. I mean, even nowadays, that may be deemed too, too violent. Oh my god, I killed a rat. Even the way this background looks with the red of uh, cool visual look. And the look of art. I mean, with the, the Blu-ray, this looks pretty damn good. The model work, the red glow. I still think it looks cool. 
you know, just dis distinction. You can't have that. We gotta have every fucking, you know, buildings blow up that look the fucking same. So they just run together. And no personality and distinction. Oh, this whole theme with the, the fake faces. Which they tried to be clever in the remake. Because they have a woman that's similar to this. And oh, maybe that's Arnold, but it's not. It's the person behind... And again, you have this whole thing with the the face changer that just not as impressive, not as cool looking. <clears throat> of course, great timing that my guy said just happens to be right there. Quato lives. Well, we'll find out who Quato is later. So I guess the mass only had one, a few voices. <laughs> Out of the, the ideas that the the mechanism is malfunctioning, or what the deal is with here. I feel like, what the fuck is going on? This girl just... She's seen demons or something. She's possessed. Watch it. She's possessed. Quaid. She's a schizo. She's having a schizo fest. And it is cool, it just looks cool. And that just looks cool to me. It's creative. This face opens up like this, and you throw it, it's a bomb. It's like, wow, that's something I haven't really seen before like that. But we can't have that creativity nowadays. We gotta make consistent fucking sequels, consistent fucking remakes, consistent fucking requels. Same shit, same day. There's plenty of fucking stories that have never been made into a movie. Like, this was a story that never got made into a movie. Take in, there's plenty of other stories. But no, years ago we have to remake Total Recall because Total Recall was a big name. Because as a business venture, because it's the movie business, we want to make money and we think this name will make us money, thus we're going to do it. And there you go. I always thought this one guy was kind of interesting, this guy he talks to, which I've seen him before in a lot of movies too, as, like, smaller roles. Yeah, I don't remember his name, but I know I've seen him in other movies. The, the guy with the beard. But even, like, small parts like that, you get someone that Either unique in look or demeanor or again not just someone from a fucking G two catalog. <clears throat> I 
And yeah, I love the red lighting. But it just is Mars, but I mean... From what I understand, when Ronald Shoe said and Dan O'Bannon were writing the script, the tough thing that they could not crack was the third act. Like, what would happen in the third act? Does the short story, I mean... Like, yeah, it's now a long story, hence short story. So they came up with the whole, give these people air, have the hero do something really big where the air is controlled and some people are dying because they're being punished and Arnold's able to give air to Mars so people can actually breathe and not be controlled by this upheaval government what you want to call them I mean that's part of the science fiction but this is a science fiction movie that's the thing is that can you really get that mad at science fiction it's not realistic yeah that's why it's science fiction science fiction <laughs> but people tend to forget that But you know, do you do have movies that then tout themselves? We're so realistic. We're so realistic. This movie doesn't do that. But there are other movies that are so pretentious. We're so realistic and we're so real. It's like no, you're not. That and that and that and that is total science fiction. So get off your high horse. Like Rob Zombie, I want to make a Michael Myers movie and it's real. I'm like, dude, the motherfucker is a little squad of a kid and then became an eight foot tall motherfucker. And then, you know, got shot six times, including in the head, and he's not dead, especially by the next one. Don't tout this realism shit if that's the case. What is he, 50 Cent Michael Myers? 50 Cent Myers? Anyway. <clears throat> and again, yeah, I think a lot of this was shot in Mexico. And they would build these sets and stuff. Probably for, for budgetary reasons. I mean, there's still a decent sized budget, but still they wanted to... If you shoot in L.A., it'd be incred incredibly more expensive. It's like people... Uh, you know, if you try to shoot in L.A., you don't... Know, be up shit creek pretty much. This damn chair. Oh. Squeaky as hell, this chair. But I like this chair. It has a well you can't see it now, but you just has like a old school look to it. So I, I still like this chair. I wanna see if I can find any trivia for this. Ooh, sex S E H the last resort for a good time asked for Molina. Molina is Rachel Titatin. So we'll see her in a bit. And sorry, that's my stomach. I have not eaten yet. I was going to eat after this. So calm down, stomach. I know you're hungry. You're hungry. See, I saw the titties even on the flyer and it was hungry. It's like, yep, we will eat some poontain later. Calm down. You ready for the poontang? <laughs> there we have Benny. There we got our bad guys coming in. We have five kids to feed. Benny here. Screw you. Uh, let me find out his name, Benny. Actually, now let me hear. Let's see. Benny is Mel Johnson Jr. He would be... He would work on Broadway. 
he's a producer. <clears throat> Apparently he produced Rad Doll, Killjoy. He was a producer on some of this. He worked in TV. He worked in a few other movies, but nothing I recognize. Hideous in 1997. And The Shadow of the Cobra 2004. So yeah, not a lot of big uh, deals here. Uh, we have the, the Martian, the, the mutations, so to speak. Yeah, Harry was Robert Costanzo. And well, he was the voice in the Batman the Anime series, I believe. Yeah, as Harvey Bullock, the detective. the His buddy Harry at the beginning. The guy I said was in City Selectors. He was also in Die Hard 2, that's right, Die Hard 2. At the very beginning of Die Hard 2, he gave John McClane shit. And found out that he was brothers with Dennis Franz's character. And, uh, sorry, I'm looking up some other info. Ah, we have the one with the three titties. Very nice. Ah, uh, now this guy here, by Rachel Tikitin, with his face all, the one side of his face, that is Dean Norris. Dean Norris was in a lot of stuff. And later on, he would be in... He was a detective in the Death Wish movie with... Yeah, this guy with the face on the side. That's Dean Norris. I'm like, yeah, I recognize him and stuff. He was on the Tremors TV show. That was out for a little bit. He played... What was his character's name? I want to get it right. Where is it? I don't remember when the hell that show came out. Yeah, this guy is walking towards Arnold. That's Dean Norris. He was a detective at the Death Wish remake with Bruce Willis. He was on the Tremors TV show as Agent Twitchell. He was in like ten, most of the episodes of that. And that's stupid cats. Yeah, he was in Jet Li's The One. He was in The the, the Negotiator. He's, yeah, a lot of TV and movie work. Gets a 7.5 on IMDb. That's a pretty good rating. Yeah, here's Rachel Tikitin. I did. If you looked at, like I said, the original April O'Neil in the Mirage, the original Mirage comics, Rachel Tikitin fits that bill. Actually, I wonder if I could find that. Mirage. Comics. April. See, I wonder if this will show up. Okay. Think of Rachel Tikitin. Now look at this. That is Rachel Tikitin. That is absolutely Rachel Tikitin in this movie. She's even got the type of earrings that I'm watching it. Look at the earrings. It's not the same, but she's got these... It's not the same type of earrings, but she's got like these big earrings. And it's not the same type, but this is Rachel Tikitin in Total Recall. Just put her in that outfit. That is April O'Neil. 
That's crazy. I watch this now. You know, an hour and I mean, at 59 minutes in, give or take. That's Rachel Tititit. So, and that would work. So. And she does a good job in this film. She does a really good job. Ooh, those three tits. <laughs> Say again, you can't go this far with it, otherwise it'd be deemed sexist. So, this is, seems like a nice story. Arnold noticed that Michael Ironside was constantly on the phone between tapes. When he broached the subject, Ironside said that his sister was suffering from cancer. Arnold brought Michael to his trailer. They had an hour-long, three-way conversation with Ironside's sister about what exercises she should do, what kind of food she should be eating. Ironside has never forgotten Schwarzenegger's kindness, and neither has his sister. That's a really nice story. That's a really nice story. Brands, I need to be trivia. Who knows what's true, what's not. But if that's true, if that's true, then that's a nice story. This was one of the last major Hollywood blockbusters to make large scale use of miniature effects as opposed to CGI. Yeah. It says here that actually the X-ray scanner was using early type of CG. Interesting, if that's the case. <laughs> the go figure. Yeah, the this is where we have uh, Roy Brocksmith as doctor, this doctor. And when you listen to him, he's pretty much telling the whole third act of the movie. So that gets into, is Arnold's character really under this episode of this accident? Because again, or is it, well he knows the plan because he's working with the bad guys, so he knows this is the plan he's supposed to do. And instead of lying, I'm just going to tell him the truth and what his version of the truth would be in them make him believe me more. And yeah, this actor, he was on the commercial we saw earlier in the film, and he was in arachnophobia in the same year he was, was it a, I can't remember what character, I knew who he played, but I don't remember his character's name. Uh, the x-ray scenes, the software intended to use to be fully computer animated didn't work, so animators had no choice but to do the animation by hand using live action film sequences as a reference. So there you go. Arnold felt the original trailer was bad and misrepresented the film. They agreed it was selling the film short, so they had a new one made as well as a new campaign. If it's the the with that teaser, I do like that teaser because it creates a sense of mystery. The one where Arnold's face is on the side and then turns to the camera. Grant, I mean, it didn't tell you much about the film, but that's what I liked about it. It was a cool looking teaser, but I guess. Some people are like, what the fuck is this? I don't know what this is. I'm not going to see it. Let's see.
Uh, to me, like, the way this plays out is so much better than in the, the remake. Just, number one, you don't have all these fucking lens flares that get in the way of the scene. And the way this doctor's explaining it... Seems... Like this would be the case. Like perhaps this would be the case. And this actor, like, yeah, you could do this, but then this is what's going to happen to you. And he says it with conviction and gives Arnold's character pause. Like, wait a minute, what if this guy is right? I didn't, he says it with such conviction in his eyes and his voice. This is why he gives Arnold pause, but then he sees the sweat. And that's a better tell than in the original where... Oh, if this character's in a dream and she's crying, I'm like, well, she'd be crying anyway because it's her dream. But here, it's, wait a minute, why would he be sweating? Why would he be nervous if he's gun ho on this? Because you see no one else is sweating, so what, he's nervous about it? So he's ready to be convinced, but then... What the hell is that? Ooh, that's a nice headshot. Nicely done. Such a great... Uh, the, I miss that type of visceralness in movies. It automatically doesn't give you the pass, but it, it helps, man. It's like great seasoning for the for the meal. Arnold using his strength. see yeah Arnold and Paul wanted to do another movie after this called The Crusade financial problems Tassar Greenlit Cutthroat Island cancel Crusade Yeah, back to the day, Patrick Swayze or Richard Dreyfuss was up for the part of Quaid. I we all Rachel T. Ten getting some business done. Damn. Robert Davi and Torrey Smith turned down the role of Richter. Smith felt the role was too similar to his character, Clarence Bodicer and Robocop. I can understand that. And I'm fine with that because Michael Ironside was able to get it. He did a great job. Oh, wait, I gotta pause for this bit here. One of the great Arnold lines. I did nowadays. You couldn't do this to be labeled too cold blood. I'm like, again, this trying to murder you. Trying to murder you. <sighs> Consider that a divorce. I mean, it just works to me.
Hmm, let's see. So I'm reading that apparently Daniel Bennett had a different idea for the ending. I guess I'll mention that. It says here, Daniel Bennett was never happy with the ending that was filmed. The Martian machine creating a breathable atmosphere. Daniel Bannon's idea was, it was supposed to be a three-fingered Martian handprint on the machine. That was supposed to have been a print of Quaid's hand, which matched only his hand. Quaid, Earth's top secret agent, went to Mars and entered the compound. The machine killed him and created a synthetic duplicate. He is that synthetic duplicate. He cannot be killed because he can anticipate danger before it happens. He is also omnipotent, and because he cannot be killed, Earth wants to kill him but cannot. That's why they go to all the trouble to erase his brain to make him think he's nobody. It's the only way they can control him. Audiences don't question it when movie heroes go through adventures and don't get killed. I thought it was clever to actually have a reason for it. At the end of the picture, Quaid puts his hand on the device and all comes back to him, who he really is. His total recall of his identity is that he is a creation of a Martian machine. He is, in effect, a resurrection of the Martian race in a synthetic body. He turns and says to the other characters, it's going to be fun to play God. Yeah, I think that would have been a bit too much. A bit too much. Maybe for a different movie, but for this movie, a bit too much. Sometimes a bit simpler is a bit better. So yeah, this was more Ronald shoots that's baby. You could say. Again, I, I do like this scene too. Because you see a bit of the scope with all these different cool looking drills everywhere. I always like the design of these. Which would make sense because if you're down through all these underground system you don't have these big old machines that seem to have drills everywhere of course my driver's has the big fucking gun there you go crash right into the damn thing <laughs> Sorry, I... Uh, I, I like looking up info, but people, I'm sure it's like, well, get to the fucking film. I know. I will. I mean, there's IMDb trivia. Look at this piece of shit. You kill a woman with three tits, you know he's a bad guy. Any guy that will kill a woman who's got three tits, you know he's a villain. Here go, Peter Dinklage. You want to bitch about this? Look what happens here. You want to bitch about Snow White and shit? Look at this. Here's a woman who has to be small, and guess what? Here's a knife, and stick him. There you go. Shotgun fun. Gives her machine gun. Get the fuck out of our bar. Fuck you all. Get him, Dean Norris. Nice stunt there. Nice jump through the glass. Good bit of slow motion. Used a little bit, but used in the right way.
And that's what Ronnie Cotts wants. Of course, Ryan Cotts would work with Paul Verhoeven in Robocop. And before that, I, Ronnie Cox, I don't think, played a villain much. Because you got to think, Ronnie Cox, he was in Deliverance with Burt Reynolds, and he's one of the, the four men who get attacked by these hillbillies. Beverly Hills Cop, he was the nice police captain who is friendly with Eddie Murphy. But because of Roller Cop and this, I always don't think of Ronnie Cox as, oh, he's a villainous guy, a villainous character. And because in these two films, Ronnie Cox made a, a great impression as a villain. I would say even more so in this. Like, Robocop, he does a good job, but I think because in this one, you have that. Well, he has that speech, like, I'll be back in time for cornflakes. <laughs> Oh, here he takes away the air. It's punishment for these people. And Arnold does something. See, with Daniel Ban, his idea... I'm like, eh... Duplicate idea, it just seems a bit... Now you're trying to be a bit too complicated. And it's like, eh, you know... I think you, you have enough here already as is. You do. You have the whole thing with the secret agent and the is it real, is it not real. You have that storyline. You have this whole Mars mythology storyline and the Martians of old and their technology and what that could possibly bring to the people here and the agent here working for the bad guys. But when he finds out who he truly is, he's like, yeah, he wants to do good he must do the right thing. <clears throat> Things where you find out he's a mutant. Another cool effect here. It's like, what the fuck happened to his hand? What the hell? That still looks pretty damn cool. Apparently, Cap felt the same way. He's like, yeah. So, like, yep. That's still kind of cool. Like, he just takes his hand off and shows the people, like, wow, okay, it's neat. And here we have the resistance. Uh, we have uh, Marshall Bell talking to the little TV screen. Yeah, Marshall Bell here, where we find out that in his stomach is Quato. Marshall Bell has been in a lot of stuff, too. He was also in Starship Troopers. He would be in... He was in Number on Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. He was the coach who Freddy killed in the shower. Coach was Snyder. Was that his character's name? Snyder? He was also in Virus, the Jamie Lee Curtis film that could have been cool, but they fucked it up. See, that's a film that has some nice effects, but that doesn't save it because like Jamie Lee Curtis' character is completely worthless in the film. She doesn't do anything. She doesn't accomplish anything. She doesn't fight anything. She just fucking, like, this is your lead. She doesn't really do shit. Except get tortured in one scene. <laughs> Fried. Electrocuted, whatever. And Marsha Bell's another good actor. But again, there's a lot of good actors in this movie. You know, Arnold and Rachel Tickerton and Michael Ironside and Marshall Bell and Ronnie Cox. And it's kind of an interesting idea that how do you hide a res resistance leader? Well, it's inside someone, really. <laughs> it's inside this person.
and again, stuff like this, that's like, wow, okay, that's unique. That's creative. And pretty cool. Like Yoda meets Basti Case. <laughs> if Yoda met Basti Case or something. And that's a, a fake Marshall Bell. That's a real Marshall Bell with like an arm. In. That's a fake Marshall Bell. I wonder why they used the fake Marshall Bell there. Does it seem like you could probably have the real Marshall Bell and then, I don't know, have him like lay down or something with his arms and his head, like lay down on his stomach and then have like a puppeteer behind him and just the way you frame it. Like, like imagine laying down but your head is up and you got your arms, or at least his head looking down, this and that. But still looks pretty cool. Open your mind, Quaid. Open your mind. I just showcase that the bad guys know about this because this is a this is a way to give air to people, but we're not going to do that so we can control and they have to pay for it and shit. Don't we have like Ronnie Cox or Mike Ironside or someone? Yeah, there's Ronnie Cox and Mike Ironside, yeah. So they know about this, but we're going to control it so people have to pay for it and... <clears throat> but, uh... Arnold knows about this too. And he's going to find a way to turn this shit on. Very nice job by Jerry Goldsmith on the music. Which I know Jerry Goldsmith got criticized for this film because he said, oh, there's no theme. I don't know if I would say that. That there's no theme. I mean, theme as in, you know, it's not the first thing you can hum, like Indiana Jones, you know, John Williams. Da, 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 da. You know, Star Wars. Da, 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 da. Or even like Rambo. Da, 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 but it's still a damn good score. Yeah, drills coming out of the woodwork, sadly killing most of the resistance. Do you find out that uh, he was used uh, to be this fucking mole? And it still gets into that. I mean, I also disagree with Daniel Bannon that, well, the reason he doesn't like the, the stuff with the air is that it takes away from the identity things that was part of the whole story. Well, I disagree because you're still focusing on that for a good chunk of it. Even, like, you don't know who the identity of this leader is. Oh, it's this guy with Quato hidden in his chest, his stomach. Oh, you think you trust Benny, he's the funny guy, he's a nice guy. Nope, he's working with the bad guy. So that's another difference in identity. Oh, here's Arnold finding out what really his identity is and what the whole purpose is. But I would bet that was probably a big shock for audiences back in the day. Because Benny, is, he's kind of a funny, comedic, sidekick. That's what it seemed like it would be in a typical film. As Again, that's not the case here. I 
Like, can you imagine, like, a bad guy shooting Baby Yoda like that? That would never fly today. <laughs> Baby Yoda. <laughs> that guy would be the biggest villain ever. Well, or the biggest hero to some, but... <clears throat> Fuck you. <laughs> and this is where he sadly finds out that he's been used the whole time. That his old version of himself. <clears throat> he's innocent. But you find out that Quaid was a double agent where... Worked with Roddy Cox. Well, I mean, you saw the film, you know what it's about. I, I thought that was a really interesting take on the story. And it's like, oh shit. It gives you a lot of sympathy for the lead guy because he's trying to do the best that he can. <clears> then <throat> he finds out, well, this is who I am. This bullshit artist. As okay, that was like the old self, and you feel really bad for this new self. How the plan wasn't working perfectly. See, Arnold says they're too perfect. And Roger's like, bullshit it was. You got turned on too early. All this chaos that happened. I'm surprised it even worked. <laughs> I like that they put that in the strip because the odds, oh, what? I like that they, they worked that into the strip. I thought that was a smart piece of uh, writing. And then here's proof in case you're, what, my mother? And just the look on Arnold's face. See, he did a good job acting. I mean, uh, did you have credit? I think throughout the the eighties to nineties, I was I liked Arnold. I was more of a Stallone guy, because I think Stallone is a better actor. Although I think Arnold is a good actor for what he does. I think he does a good job here. This realization, this sunken feeling that he's been screwed over by himself, as well as Tohagen. But I was just, I always thought Stallone was a better actor when I looked at Copland, I See You. But Arnold did a good job like End of Days. But like Stallone, I just got more into Rambo and I got more into Tango and Cash. I got more into Cobra and Cliffhanger, Demolition Man. But Arnold was the better businessman, to be fair. Like, Arnold kind of knew he was a commodity. He knew he was a... He knew what he was, in a business sense. He knew, I had to pitch certain directors, uh, this bigger-than-life personality, I have to, in a way, appreciate it and go with it. People think of me as this bigger than life personality, like the the body, the I had to do those type of films. So Predator, Running Man and Commando and Total Recall and He had more hits. I mean you look at Stallone. I I, I love many of those films in the eighties and nineties, but really the only hits in the eighties were Rocky or Rambo. Cobra made a little bit of money, but it wasn't that much money. Over the Top was a bomb. Tango and Cash maybe made a little bit of money, but not that much money. Locked Up, Sally Bombed. Over the Top, like said, Sally Bombed. Then you have bombs like Rhinestone and, and other stuff. Oster didn't do well. Stop Remind Will Shoot didn't do well. Judge Dredd didn't do well. Cliffhanger did. Demolition Man did okay. But then, you know. Arnold seemed like he had a little bit better business sense. 
just I think Stallone was always fighting with himself where he's an actor star, but he wants to be an actor. He got into the writing a lot more and that got into more conflicts with people. Um, Arnold seemed like he kind of left the writing alone. Like, I'm sure he had ideas, but he kind of... Think of the directors like John McTiernan, Paul Verhoeven, James Cameron, Ivan Reitman, you know, in comedy. Like, he worked with really good directors, and Stallone... I mean... He never worked with any of those guys directing, you know, that they were the director. Like, Stallone never worked with Paul Verhoeven. Stallone never worked with James Cameron, where James Cameron directed. He never worked with John McTiernan or, again, Ivan Reitman directing him. Uh, we had a nice, nice, right in the neck. Boom! I like the blood right... Yeah, I mean, you did smack... With that fucking thing, your face is going to be bloody. There you go. Boom. I like the, the blood on Arnold's neck. Boom. Yeah. Ew. I mean, it's quick, but you see enough of just how that thing like went here and outside these... Ugh. <laughs> uh, the idea that visceralness does help. And these are one of my favorite pieces of the store. Like it gets the inner, your your adrenaline pumping. I miss Jerry Goldsmith, man. I really do. Fantastic composer. I mean, it doesn't mean every single score he did was perfect. Who did? But him, like, John Carpenter is a favorite of mine as well. But I think of it as director, composer. I just been like strictly only did composing, that's it. Jerry Dolce is my favorite. There's other people close, Hans Zimmer, some of James Horner, John Williams. James Horner, especially for Aliens, like that store is one of my favorite stores, Aliens. That, alone put him, that movie alone put him high on my list. Uh, Hans Zimmer, Mark Mancina, who worked on Bad Boys and Speed. There's others as well, but if I would go like Jerry Goldsmith, John Carpenter, like I said, Hans Zimmer would be up there, and and James Horner for Aliens, and and uh, Mark Mancina. <clears throat> See, Arnold knows what to do. He just needs to get there. In a way, it's almost like a video game. Now he's on, you know, he defeated the level. He hit the quick time event to get out of this before you get your brain scrambled. Quick time, put on the. Da -da 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 -da. Yes, you escaped. Oh, now you have uh, another you know, sub boss. This is the boss for the level. Oh shit, that doesn't work. Damn, I gotta find the sweet spot. I, mean, I love that look of the blood on Arnold's neck. It just, I don't know, just something distinctive about it. Uh, uh, Arnold, his business and his job, we saw at the beginning, taught him a little bit how to do this. Cause he, he, we saw him working with a drill before, so he knows a little bit about that. Yeah, like those little bits there, it's like, ouch. There you go. No more oil pressure. 
and I wait for the another great moment here. God, back to the day you had action films like this. After the seal, ooh, that rot that just bounced off Richard Tinkerton's body. I wonder if that was like like rubber that they just painted to look like a rock. Benny here. And he's like, where the fuck are you? Here you go. Come on. Screw you. <laughs> there you go. All you need is just the blood dripping from the drill and you got the, the hint. Because they don't, they don't do too much more gore. Otherwise it would get an X rating. NC-17, whatever you want to call it, is the MPAA. It seems like the MPAA is more easier nowadays than they were back then. Like, nowadays they seem... Like, you never hear anything nowadays about uh, them battling with the MPAA. Think about that. When was the last movie you heard that, all oh, the MPAA could... But that was a thing way back in the day in the... Especially the late 80s, early 90s. The later Friday the 13th films. Even Hard Target. Oh, we can't do this because Hard Target will be NC-17. Wait. Even that new fucking Halloween Kills movie. Which is rated R. It had more blood than Hard Target. Well, Hard Target is a way better movie for like a hundred reasons. But it just, the MPA just. They're so fucking full of shit. And just see how times have changed. Here's Michael Ironside with his buddies here. I think there's a decent amount of action in this. We still got 46. About... Mm, a little more than 15 minutes left. Ah, uh, the du image duplicator. I could turn on the, the light for the end of this. Why not? Be right back. Just gonna turn on the light a little bit. Oh, you see my face for the end now that everything's red. Okay, everything's like red now. That's strange. Well, that's cool. You know, actually, you know, it says it takes place on Mars. Maybe this red actually works. <laughs> I'll keep it. Let's see if it fixes a little bit. Well, I guess it's going to be red. Yeah, actually, you know what I did? This works for the Mars <laughs> scenes. If I would have known that, I would have had this whole time. Ah, there you go. There's Arnold taking care of business. You think this is real? Yeah. <laughs> He's got a hologram. I didn't give people what they want, and Arnold kind of knew that. He kind of knew. I didn't. He he knew he was a commodity. That's why I say Arnold was a little bit of a smarter businessman this time. He knew what the audience wanted. You think this is the real Quaid? It is. <laughs> See, like, Arnold knew to do stuff like that. You know, those fun lines and the, the gunfire, the body count. Like, Stallone. The thing with Stallone, you could tell he always wanted to be taken seriously as an actor. And that's why Parmi appreciates that and appreciates films he did like Over the Top and Lock Up and stuff that he was a bit more of his. But then it's like the audience want him to just do more. Not that type of stuff. That's why films like that bombed. The like Stallone. We want to see another Rambo or Rocky or something. We don't want to see again uh, some of those movies. <clears throat> I 
Damn, this is like a dried out fight in this elevator. Boom. <laughs> Uh, trying to drive him down. Goodbye, Ironside. <laughs> yeah. See you at the party, Rita. <laughs> it's like, yeah, he cuts off a guy's arms and throws the arms back. Again, you wouldn't see Stallone do that type of stuff. But Arnold was willing to be that... Kind of the Superman over-the-topness that audiences wanted from him. He was willing to do that, and... Again, to repeat one last time, that's why, he, in all fairness... As much as I like Stallone more than Arnold, but Arnold was a sm smarter businessman... And he had more box office hits. A variety. I didn't Stallone. Unless it was Rocky and Rambo. Maybe your cliffhanger. Not many of his films were hits. When you looked at it. Like actual. Truly hits. Cobra and Tango and Cash. Like maybe overseas. But. <laughs> the cornflakes line. Yeah, yeah, I don't agree with the Dan O'Ban idea that, oh, this was a, oh, what if he was a Martian duplicate? Sounds like that fucking movie Imposter, which I wasn't a fan of. Yep, they have Rachel Tickleton something to do, at least. Which is nice. Or Mirage <laughs> comments April O'Neil. Fuck you, bomb. Now, we get to the one scene that, okay, if I have... I love the film. I've been praising it. If there's one scene that is ridiculous, is this scene coming up? It's not the scene with, you know, them... Not this stuff here. This stuff is cool. You know, it's that steepism. Will we get to the thing in time? You know, it's a Martian handprint, so this is a different thing. So you almost gotta do like a Vulcan thing to press down. Almost. I don't know if he, if he does like three and one or two and two or. I forget. <coughs> Oh, well, maybe not. It's I think is it four fingers? Of course, Ryan Cost got out there first. That's why he's going to die. While the others do live, because he was out there longer. Be like, no shit. Drew away for the bad guy to die. Nice door away. Okay, so it's four fingers. So it's like yeah, like this. Start the reactor. When they get out, it's okay. When they get out and the eyeballs talk or come out this fucking far, and then when they get air. Then the eyeballs retract back to normal and they're perfectly fine. Arnold and Rachel TT10. I'm like, come on now. Like, this is a bit too much. Like, come on. Obviously, it's trying to be suspense and, oh my god, are they going to die? Are they going to make it in time? But it's like, again, when your eyeball's that fucking far off. <laughs> like the Ryan Cost death scene is pretty cool, over the top, violent. I don't know why that was a little like toothbrush to me. 
those damn things coming down. <clears throat> the heated toothbrush is going into <laughs> pretty much is all this stuff here trying to get oxygen. Thankfully, is that a process that took like five minutes to do. Otherwise, they'd be dead as fuck. Yeah, wake up, everybody. Wake up. Damn, no one even, like, Dean Norris's shoulder, no one even bought, like, the bandage it? Or changed the shirt? <laughs> There we go. A lot of shaking going on. Shake, shake, a lot of shaking going on. Shake, rattle, and roll. We're going to shake, rattle, and roll. Because, uh, I don't say of course, but you know, model work being used here. Which works? I mean, model work can. Well, okay, the the eyes are not budging like four inches away, okay. It, it wasn't as bad as I remember it being. They both pretty fucking far, and it's like, you know, I don't know if your eyes would go back to normal and be perfectly fine. Wouldn't the eyes just kind of sit there like, whoop, I guess I have my eyes now two inches further. I mean, it's something that's a bit like, uh, <laughs> but the, the idea in the movie had a, you know, when it goes a, a lot of things right and a lot of merit to it, there's things you can forgive. There's no movie is perfect. There's a lot of things you can forgive and, and go with. It's like, okay, sure. Like, okay, look how far Arnold's eyes were. And then they go back and not even like bleeding on the eyes or I better get my eyes checked. <laughs> it's like okay. You just go along with it. You either go along with it or you don't. Again, thankfully this whole thing took like 30 seconds. Which that's pretty fucking fast. And I know this is stupid, but would you have a blue sky still? I mean, forgive me for being stupid, but... Aren't there other factors that make the sky blue? Maybe that's just me. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But it's to do it to further showcase that there's breathable air, so it's all, it's now more like Earth. And Mars have changed forever. But again, that's where you get the... Arnold saying... I'm scared that this is just a dream. Well, kiss me before you wake up. And he... Yeah, that nice Jerry Goldsmith motif. That's why I don't really look at this as, like, he... He dreamed all this, and then he got a lobotomy. But it does create an interesting, either talk, debate, however you want to call it. I think one time Arnold wanted to do a sequel. I don't know what the sequel would have entailed. 
I mean, a sequel would have been interesting, but... I mean, look at Arnold, Rachel Tichetin, Sharon Stone, Ronnie Cos, Michael Arnson, Marshall Bell. There you go, Dean Norris as Tony. Bobby Costanzo as Harry, guy at the beginning. Yeah, great movie. Great movie. Still holds up to this day. Robert Picardo, I thought he sounded familiar. Robert Picardo, who was in The Howling. He was the guy that the female gremlin was attracted to in Gremlins 2. Remember Gremlins 2, the new batch? Well, yeah, that guy at the very end and the female gremlin wanted to kiss the guy. The guy, that's Robert Picardo. Uh, he, he was in inner space. Done a lot of other stuff, especially with Joe Dante. They worked in Star Trek later. He was the voice of Johnny Cab. I thought his voice sounded familiar. Robert Picardo, okay. Yeah, this film came out was a big hit. Was a big hit, and I think really helped Arnold in his career. Because before this, I mean, again, Twins was a hit, but like Red Heat didn't do much. I liked Red Heat, but I mean, box office wise, it didn't really set anything on fire. Even the Running Man, Sally. Didn't do as well as people hoped. Although I love The Running Man. But it didn't do that well. Oh, trainer. Sven Ol Thorson. They know his trainer. His buddy Sven Ol Thorson. He's a guy in The Running Man. The Guard. I guess he got to go score some steroids. And leaves for Richard Dawson. to get take it out by Arnold. Uh, he was also in, I mean, Abraxas. <laughs> As the villain. That movie with Jesse Ventura as the star. Special visual effects by Dream Quest Images. Just looking at the credits. <clears throat> Miniatures provided by Stetson Visual Services. Metro Light Studio did the skeleton sequence. Industrial Light and Magic worked on this. Division of Lucas Arts Entertainment. Character Visual Fest by Rob Bouteen. He did the, the the puppetry and his effects crew. It is a combination of all this stuff put together. And yeah, this film was a hit, and I was saying it probably led the character going, okay, let's do Terminator 2. Here's the budget. And it came out and was a massive success. And then after that, Arnold did Last Hatchet Hero, which was a a bomb, pretty much. Although I liked Last Hatchet Hero quite a bit. Then uh, True Lies, that was afterward. You play the Nintendo game? Yeah, don't play the Nintendo game. The Nintendo game ain't worth a pot to piss and ain't worth shit. The Nintendo game sucks. Fuck the Nintendo game. So the the I for, I didn't really forgot they advertised the damn Nintendo game. Bullshit! Don't play a Nintendo game. Ain't worth a pot to piss in. A TriStar release. And there you go. There's Total Recall. Still a classic. Damn good movie. Entertain action film. Good sci-fi elements. With that said, thanks for watching, take care, and we'll see you guys later. Oh, it's funny, as soon as the Mars stuff is done, now the light is normal, so that's serendipitous. We'll see you guys later.